Everybody has their Bible? Would you turn to Joel chapter 2? How many of you A students also have your little blue notebook today? Could I see those? Do you have those? It just puts a smile on my face. See those? Oh, look, that one's dancing around back there. Thank you. Okay, we'll use these today. I have some assignments for you in your little notebooks, but I hope you're also putting your own notes and pictures in there during the week as you pray through the book of Joel and get as much out of this as you possibly can. Joel chapter 2, we, we move into our second in this teaching series, and I want to begin this one this way. Recall a time, just exercise your imagination with me for a second. I'll let you finish getting settled. Recall a time in your life where you were so close to the Lord. For most of you, you immediately thought of some place and time. Remember that moment, you were, that time, that season in your life, you were just so close to your Lord, you kind of compare everything else to that moment. You know what I'm talking about? Recall a time when you were so close to the Lord. What was that like? Can you describe it to me? It was comforting. It was safe. Sorry, it was passionate. These are all good. What else? Love. Is that what you said, Dave? You experienced love. Yes, Smokey. Full of joy. You were praying without ceasing. Thank you, Hank. So that's going to go into the next part. Everybody ready? You guys didn't get a chance to talk. I know you're just busting to talk, this group is. Here's the next part. What were you doing? What kinds of things were you physically doing? I don't mean to say, well, I was right with the Lord, brother. I mean, what specifically were you doing? Praying without ceasing. What else? Yes, Michelle. You were just worshiping all the time. What else were you doing? You remember that. You still hunt, but things are but hunting is a good place to be quiet or to make your mind quiet. Good. Piper, what were you gonna say? You were sleeping under the Christmas tree right beside baby Jesus in the nativity. Right? Good answer. Amy, what were you gonna say? And we got, to, we got to watch that on you both. And that was great for us to see your testimony through that. Because we were expecting to need to really, you know, encourage you and see you in tears. But you guys were just, bo- I think both of you are going to hit the same, you're in the set stride there during that time. And uh, thank you for being, let's make this, let's take this up a notch. When you were closest to the Lord, was everything going great in your life then? Maybe because you were asleep under the Christmas tree (laughs) or you were hunting, but maybe not, right? Let's get really real about this. Sometimes you're going through the hardest time in your life and somehow you brought yourself to the point where afterwards you could say thank you. Somebody was going to mention something here. Peyton, what were you going to say? You were playing with the dog? Is that what you said? You were sleeping with a dog. What a, what a peaceful place to be also. Uh, so we were praying. We were worshiping. We were going through challenging times. What other things were we going through? Were we do, what other things were we doing when we were so close to the Lord? What were you going to say, Laura? You were fighting with him. She said, with her face and the shag carpet. How many of you had those moments before? Close to the Lord. So you don't necessarily want to relive some of these, right? But you were close to the Lord, right? Like if you were, Israel messed up a lot. But if you were at least were to ask the prophets or the Lord himself about some of their favorite time together, the Lord would say, remember that time when you just left Egypt, scared to death, didn't know where your next meal was coming from? 
or the next drink of water was coming from or if another group of people were going to come and kill you. Yeah, those were sweet days. The Lord calls it his time of uh, like the honeymoon stage. This was our honeymoon stage together when you depended upon me for everything. Before you got to the point where you realized you didn't really need me anymore. Right? So recall the things that you were doing, praying, the times when you looked forward to your prayer times. You weren't doing it by duty. Right? You weren't doing it because it's a chore. You looked forward to it. You ran to it. Remember you ran to that place where you prayed. Some of you can still picture the shag carpet or the, the tree. For me, it was this big hemlock tree on the front. This place where you were praying Nobody had to tell you to go to church. You loved going to church. Nobody had to tell you to get involved. You were just involved because, of course, that's what you wanted to do, right? Nobody had to tell you to bring your Bible. You went out and bought your own Bible. In fact, you bought way too many Bibles, remember? You started, you started singing music, songs to the Lord. Remember how close you were? Now, let me ask you, that place of where you were close to the Lord, that place for different people, it's different things all over the room, if you knew that the end was coming at the end of the sermon series, that August was it, wouldn't you want to go back to that place? Anybody? Wouldn't you want to go back there and say, I want to be close to him again, especially if the end is in sight, especially so. And the Lord speaks to us, even from this passage today in Joel chapter 2, and Father God says to us, he says, look, Whatever it is, return to me. Return to me. The, the end is always dangerous. I don't care who you are. It's always dangerous, and it's always closer than you think. So return to me. And we picture the story of the prodigal son, right, everybody? But today's is a very violent twist on the prodigal son story. But either way, the message of Joel last week was pay attention to the day of the Lord and do something. The message of Joel this week is raise the alarm, return to the Lord. Everybody, Joel chapter 2, we're going to actually study verses 1 to 17, but we're going to do some reading together as part of our worship. So would you mind standing? And Steve is going to come up here and read out loud for us chapter 2, verses 12 to 17 and just follow along in your bibles as he reads this out loud joel chapter 2 beginning in verse 12 yet even now declares the lord return to me with all your heart with fasting with weeping with mourning and rend your hearts and not your garments return to the lord your god for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of astounding and steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpets in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate a congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and let the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Thank you, Steve. And the entire camp said, amen. amen. And let's pray together before you're seated, okay? Father God, we have this passage that you you put this sermon as a burden of fire inside of Joel that he, that he couldn't remain silent. He had to speak it. And then, then thankfully your spirit helped him and he wrote this down so that we could read it so many, many years later. And, and in the message, though, the people were living in ancient times, but we're the same today. We wander off until our faith gets choked by the cares of the world. We're distracted we're spending our time as if everything in this life is what's most important. And then we, we give in to our temptations to follow the, the schemes of the world. And then we leave you 
I pray that every single one of us would hear you whisper in our minds and our hearts today, return. And I pray that you, as, as this goes on, I pray that you would begin to identify in our minds, make it clear to us, the things we must do to come back to our first love. The things that must be changed, I pray your spirit would illumine us as to what those are, so that by the end of this message time today, we'll be ready to respond to you. And I ask you these things in Jesus' name. And the whole camp said, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 1, the prophet yells out, pay attention. This isn't just an ordinary locust plague. This is the, everyone, day of the Lord, very good. And what we did in our little blue notebooks is we went through the entire book, all three chapters, and we highlighted every occurrence of the day of the Lord, or sometimes just the words the day, because it referred to the day of the Lord. And we're going to see that appear again in today's passage. And Joel was saying, look, you drunks, um, farmers, priests, pay attention. This is the day of the Lord, and you need to do something. And then today, he's still talking about the same army of locusts, but today he's going to, actually you're going to see something switch in verse 12, and he's going to say, uh, now the Lord's going to begin to speak, and today's message is raise the alarm, raise the alarm. You're going to notice that he says twice, blow the trumpet in Zion. You see it in verse 1. Anybody else see the second occurrence of that? Blow the trumpet in Zion. It's in chapter 2, verse 1, and it's in chapter 2, verse... 15, very good. We're going to get to both of those today, beginning in verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Like, people are asleep. People are not paying attention. People don't realize what's really at stake and what's going on. So Joel calls them to blow the trumpet, to sound the, raise the alarm. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for, here it is, everyone together, the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. You can reach it. It's right here. Verse 2, again, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations." And you know, you've heard this before, that the trumpet was really important, especially in ancient times, for calling meetings or getting everyone's attention together. And throughout the Old Testament, you see the trumpet appearing many different times. And the trumpet is pretty much always the ram's horn shofar. And so there were to be watchmen who stood on the walls of the city, right? And you, this is like in our modern day movies, right? We're all a little scared but we want to get some sleep, so somebody says, volunteers, I'll take the what? I'll take the first watch. That means we can kind of sleep a little easier because somebody else is watching out for enemies, bad guys, right? So it was the job of the watchman on the wall that when they see the enemy, they sound the trumpet. That way people can quickly pick up weapons and be ready for war. If, if these guys get scared, what if the guys on the wall get scared and run away and don't sound the trumpet? Then the blood of the inhabitants of the city is on their heads, right? They must sound the alarm. They must blow the trumpet in Zion in my holy mountain because Jerusalem was built on this very, we would call it a large hill, right? But it was considered a mountain. It was a good place to build the walls, a citadel, it was a formidable um, city, and it had been long before David ever took it. it Jerusalem's a very old city, and now Joel is kind of walking through it, preaching as if he sees an invasion army coming, but nobody's, nobody's rushing to get weapons. Somebody should be calling out the military, but nobody's doing it, and so he yells out the first words of verse 1. What does he say? Oh, you're not saying it like Joel. What does he say in verse 1? Blow the trumpet. Somebody raise the alarm. And I'm going to attempt to do this. How many of you knew that I was taking shofar lessons from Michelle Camper? And so you say, well, how's it going? Well, shofar, show good. 
Come on. That was genius. If you're sitting beside somebody that didn't laugh just now, you lean over to them and say, you do better than that one. That was, that was great. But now I'm nervous. I'm, I'm getting some stage fright, Michelle. Tell me I can do it. It's going to sound really wimpy if I don't do this right. Okay. I'll have to spit on the lips. So if this were a bigger ram's horn, it'd be easier to play, and it would make a deeper sound, right? And you've seen pictures of the long, curly ones. Those are the Yemenite shofars. And most of the time, it was a, a ram's horn shofar. That sometimes they used to put oil in, that kind of thing, but, but to blow as a trumpet. Okay. Stop stalling now. Thank you. How many notes was that? Was that two notes in there? I think maybe it'll do a three. So can I play a song now if it does three notes? So imagine sleeping tight, you know. It's, oh, it's another great night to sleep. You're in the middle of some sweet dream, right, about locusts. And then you hear it. And then this ram's horn shofar is joined by two other watchmen on the wall. And now three, four, torches are being lit. And we start to wake up thinking we, we can't even believe what's going on right now. And as we get up, some of us, are, we're in the military or we're in charge of certain groups in the city, we grab our swords or spears and shields and we run to the top of the wall or to the top of a building because we want to see what's going on and when we get up there our hearts sink because we see an army so vast we realize we can't run and we've got to fight but but they're coming fast and we can see them now chapter one everybody what, what are we talking about what is this army again what are they locusts but you're going to hear the military language like Joel is going to describe them as if they're an army by the way if you have your little blue notebooks hopefully by now you've drawn a little shofar at verse 1 and a shofar at verse 15 and how's that going by the way thank you thank you <laughs> I'll never let you forget how genius that joke was Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, because they're coming, they are a people, these locusts he describes, they're a people that are coming and they're great and strong and the like of whom has never been. And now at this point we've run up to the walls of the city and now we can see them. They're close enough for us to see in verse 3. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden in front of them, but behind them it's a desolate, desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Locusts, someone once said, are the incarnation of hunger. And someone described a locust plague, the effects of it. It looked like a wildfire had just burned through. Scorched earth policy. They eat everything in their path. And so Joel is describing them as this army and the people. Now they can see them. Look at verse 4. We can see their faces. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. And like swift steeds, so they run. These aren't just horses. What are these, everyone? These are war horses, right, trained for battle, and they are charging towards us. Think of the picture of it as they look at them, and not only can we see them now from atop the wall, where our knees begin to shake, some people begin to pass out because, verse 5, we can hear them. They're close enough that we can hear them with a noise like chariots over mountaintops. They leap, like the mountains don't slow them down. They just leap over it like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble. Imagine the sound of millions of locusts in a combined locust swarm grinding everything green in their path. Hear the sound, and he compares it to the sound of chariots, which was like a tank on the battlefield like back then, right? They can hear the sound of it. They're like a strong people set in battle array. Now notice he keeps using similes. Like, like, like. This is important later. Verse 6. Before them the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. Isn't that a much better way of saying they're scared than just say they're real scared? <laughs> Their faces are, look at everybody's faces. Everybody's, they've lost all color. They've gone pale, right? Uh, verse 7. They run like mighty men. Oh, no. 
look down. Everybody look over the wall now. They're climbing the wall like men of war. They're scaling the wall. Nothing's stopping them. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. Nothing's stopping them. They're just with their, or, like the organization of a Roman army, just picture it. They're just marching right up to us. They hit our walls, and we're expecting them to slow down, but they don't slow down. Now they're just coming right up the walls without even breaking ranks. In verse 8, they do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. Nothing's working. Nothing's stopping them. This is an unstoppable army. They run to and fro in the city. The city is now breached. And not only is it breached, it's overrun. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. Nothing can stop this army, and now they're in the city, and we are overrun. And it happened just like that. Barely had we had time to blow the trumpet. Now, here's what I wanted to do with this slide. Bear with me now. Joel is doing something. uh, The prophets weren't your typical preachers. They used some really, like, actually genius devices in their speaking. He is describing the locusts as an army for a reason. Because let's, let's leave, this, leave just this slide up here for just a moment. He's going to use the locusts as a foreshadow. So everybody just take a moment, pull out your phones, go to uh, WebsterDictionary.com. You think I'm joking. We go ahead and grab your phones and look up the word foreshadow. Because I know most of us have the idea of what it means. But in your little blue notebooks, would you just write there, uh, somewhere between, somewhere around the passages we just read, write a definition for the word foreshadow. Will you do that really quick? I'll give you just a moment to do that. A definition of the word foreshadow. It's really important to the message of Joel's passage here. You could be silent as the grave. That would be perfect. Good, good. Now, what did you find? What's, what's the definition of, of foreshadow? A warning or an indication of future events. Anybody get anything else? Is that a good definition? You've watched movies and seen foreshadow before, right, everyone? Okay, we use it a lot. It's interesting. It makes good storytelling. Something happens, uh, maybe something breaks, right? And that typifies or something else that's going to happen that's bad. As you're watching the movie or reading the story, and you say, why did the author tell me that? Because it's a foreshadow of other things that are coming. Everybody good? You got that in your notes now? This is a really important part of Joel's message. He is using foreshadow. He wants the people that he's preaching to, uh, they're kind of dull, and so he wants them to pay attention to the foreshadow. These locusts are not just locusts. He's describing them as if they're what, everyone? An army. So in a way, they are a locust army. But he wants them to look at the locusts and actually imagine something much worse. An invasion army from the north. And they could imagine this very easily. So look at the slide now and see if you can see it. When you look at the locusts, and then advance to the next slide for me, Jonathan. Can you see that really these locusts could be something much worse? They could be an invasion army. Can you guys see that in the locusts now? That's what Joel is doing. He's like, so now when you see the locusts, see the might of Sinkarib, of Assyria, who's already taken out the northern kingdom of Israel marching headlong into Judah, 
taking Jerusalem, which he could easily do. In fact, he threatens to do, probably in Joel's lifetime, but for some reason does not. Turns around and goes home for some strange reason. Talk more about that later. So he, Joel is preaching to them about the locusts and wanting them in the locusts to see an army. And so when, now when they see the locusts, they think, wow, this could be a lot worse. This could be an invasion force of Assyrians from the north. Thankfully, it's only the locust plague, and that would be hard to say back then. So that you might say also that whenever you see a large-scale disaster you could see or at least think of it as a foreshadow of a much worse disaster that could come and the ultimate day of the Lord which is coming later, right? So not something small, not like, well, my battery in my car died. It must be the day of the Lord, right? Like not that, something, something much, much bigger like a locust plague that's, that's wiping out our livelihood, that's slowing down our worship, that's really affecting us like it did the, the Israelites. So picture something that's large-scale devastation that happens like over nations, right? That is a picture of a foreshadow, Joel says, of what could be a much worse day of the Lord unless we repent. But not only that, it's a foreshadow of the ultimate, the day of the Lord. And that's my last slide here. So now, can you see in that also the ultimate day of the Lord when stars fall, when the sun goes dark, When the moon turns to blood, when people run into caves to hide themselves, when people want to die rather than face the wrath of God. That's what Joel is doing here in all the layers. So Joel wants the people he's preaching to to see the locusts, and he uses the locusts as a foreshadow of an invasion army, which is a foreshadow of the ultimate day of judgment where everyone's thoughts are laid bare before the holy king on high before his throne. So every one of these large-scale disasters reminds us this could be much worse. We better get right, and we better get ready. That's what every prophet wants, every preacher wants. He wants the people who's hearing what he has to say to get right and to get ready. But now he's describing this army. We've read through verse 9. He's describing this army that's coming, and they're unstoppable. And and they're like, no army we've ever seen. And now they're up the walls, and they're running through the city. And the wall, the whole city is breached, and they're just running easily into people's homes. And verse 10, something incredible happens. The earth quakes before them. Even, Even the earth is afraid of this army. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. And anyone who lived in that day and time who ever saw a locust swarm knows how they can blot out the sun, right? And knows that this kind of language, people have called it decreation language. When we use it a lot in the book of Revelation, book of, I think, other apocalyptic literature like Daniel, when, when the whole earth is coming to an end, this is pretty much stock language for this is a really, really bad day. Right? This is really, really bad. Judgment day is here. Verse 11, here's the surprising part. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. Both here and later, Joel is going to call this army the Lord's army. For strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now he's just, man, that was a gut punch to all the people listening to Joel preach. Because Joel is saying, here's the worst part, the most demoralizing part of all this. As this army breaks into our city like a tidal wave, we look and who's leading them into battle? Everyone? The Lord himself. Who's shouting, who's shouting orders at the front of his army? Who's sounding the trumpet before his army saying, follow me in? Who is it, everybody? It's the Lord himself. Why is he doing this? Because he promised he would. You guys remember the covenant blessing and cursing passage in the law? The Lord says, look, if you continue to worship me and me only, I'll take good care of you. But if you ever decide to leave me, know that I will turn and fight against you. And that is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. The Lord is at the head of this army. With a, and notice that there is a voice, a shout, 
and trumpets being blown. Does that sound familiar to you? The epistles of the Apostle Paul before the coming of Christ. There's a great shout, trumpets being blown, because this is the Lord at the head of his army, which is a terrifying, terrifying thing. Do you remember this as well? This is important as you're you're taking notes, that from the 12 tribes of Israel, every tribe had a job, and from every tribe, depending on your size, you had to send a certain amount of your, your men, both young men and older men, to fight in battles, except for one tribe. One tribe did not send any of, their, any of their men to fight in battles. And that was the tribe of Levi. You remember? So the tribe of, where are you? Uh, where's the tribe of Benjamin again? Benjamin, where are you? The tribe of Benjamin over here had to send X amount of thousand soldiers to fight the Philistines. Along with the tribe of Judah, where are you, lion? Judah over here has to send thousands, X amount of thousands as well. Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali. Of course, the great tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, they all form up as they send all their men into battle, except for one tribe, and it wasn't their job to go to battle. It was the tribe of Levi. Their job was to do something much more important. They sent their, pow- they sent their men to the temple, or to the tabernacle in the Old Testament, and their job was to guard. Because we can fight the Philistines, we can fight the Canaanites, we can try to fight the Babylonians and the Assyrians, But there's someone much more dangerous than any of them, and it is the Lord of hosts. And if he breaks out against us, we're all dead. So the tribe of Levi was committed to guarding the tabernacle or the temple from anyone trying to desecrate it. Even even if it's one of us Jews trying to go in and desecrate it, their job was to kill us. Because if the Lord was to break out, he would kill every single one of us here. In fact, if if that to happen, you, you imagine at that point the Levites become the watchmen. And they need to blow the trumpet because today, in Joel's day, the Lord is actually breaking out against us. And he's leading an army into battle. So blow this ram's horn, raise the alarm, raise the alarm because this actually is the army of the Lord. So we've got a really serious problem. But notice what happens next in verse 12. Something should catch your eye there. What is so different about verse 12, everyone? For the very first time, we have someone else speaking. Who's speaking here? The Lord is speaking. Oh, and this is so good. This is the, uh, this is the game changer. Verse 12. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. Turn to me. We said raise, raise the alarm to return to the Lord. That's what the alarm should be about. It's his army. He's leading it. There's nowhere for us to go. If we're going to do anything, it needs to be to blow the trumpet so that everyone will know that we need to quickly and seriously return to the Lord because this is his army. And the only escape from this is going to be to run back to, everyone, him. Run back to the Lord. I want you to take just a moment. um, If you would do some note taking, take out your little blue notebooks for just a moment. And I want you to find a key word that's used in these verses here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Does anybody see the occurrence of the word turn? Anybody see the word turn? How many times does it appear in the next couple of verses? Verses 12 and 13. Do you see the, the use of the word turn? That is the Hebrew word shuv. Can everybody say shuv? Say, I love saying that, shuv. The word turn is also translated return. Okay, so now you have the word turn. Do you see it in verse 12? You see verse 13, you have the word return. You see verse 14, you have the word he may turn and relent. Joel is doing this on purpose. This is part of his message, okay? Did I have a little slide note of this, Jonathan? I can't remember if, this, if I had made one for this or not. There it is. So I'll give you just an example. I don't know if you can see that from where you are. But uh, in mine, I went ahead and put a box around the word relent, and then the word turn and return. These are important words because this is the invitation now. The Lord is speaking, and he's saying, return to me. And return to me, in verse 12, with all your, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend or tear your heart and not your garments. It's, It's way too easy to tear your shirt. That's not the kind of worship we need right now. We need the kind of worship that starts somewhere else. 
inside your heart. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. And all the people said, Amen. He's slow to anger and of great kindness. And all the people said, Amen. And he relents from doing harm. He doesn't want to hurt you. But he will, like a father, his son. Verse 14, who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering, a drink offering for the Yah, your God. Maybe he'll change things. I don't know. Maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he'll withdraw his army from us. I don't know. But all I do know is this is our only hope when we're fighting against the Lord is to return to him. So raise the, raise the alarm, blow the trumpet that everyone would return to the Lord and return to him with worship. And this summarizes our entire passage today. Let's flip to that next slide. That's our, one of our last slides here. Re, raise the alarm to return to the Lord with worship. And I, I couldn't write this. I know preachers are really guilty of putting exclamation marks on everything. Everything is just intensified. But you can't write this down and Joel be happy with it if it doesn't have an exclamation mark, right? Can we read this together? Raise the alarm to return to the Lord with... Now, that's, that's decent. But now read it as if Joel was here and he's a little cranky and he wants to see that exclamation mark. Ready? Raise the alarm to return to the Lord with worship. worship. Somebody says, okay, I want to return to the Lord. What do I do? Just walk up here and cry a bunch? Return to him with worship and he tells us exactly what that looks like in verse 15 now watch the rapid fire use of imperatives here remember we saw these last week and take some notes on this is my next slide if you want to do some underlining go ahead and underline these imperatives here if you want to use red like i did be super cool you can do that but listen to all of them verse 15 blow the trumpet in zion consecrate a fast call a sacred assembly Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. You hear all those? Do something, do something, do something. Worship. Worship. Fasting, prayer, gather together. I'm not, he doesn't call out everybody to go walk in fields by themselves or go find your prayer closet. Now's the time for everybody to get together and as one cry out to the Lord and maybe maybe he'll call this off verse 16 let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room usually the the newlyweds got to be exempt from all these kinds of public things right from war and that kind of thing but not now this is too important verse 17 let the priests who minister to the Yah weep between the porch and the altar let them say spare your people O Yah and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them why should they say among the peoples where is their God and now we're appealing to him as our covenant God please Please remember your covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to Moses that you would make a people of us. And to David, don't reject us, spare us, or else you're going to kill every single one of us. Return to the Lord. Raise the alarm. to No one's one's paying attention. The the drunks, the farmers, the priests, the people are, are not paying attention. So somebody blow the horn so that everyone will come back in. And that's why he repeats it in verse 15. And we have the two ram's horns being blown Return to the Lord, return to him with worship before it's too late. Recall that time when you were just really close to the Lord and how great that was. But maybe more importantly, recall what you were doing. What were you doing? Because that didn't just happen accidentally. Were you praying so often? Did you have a rich prayer life? Was it, were you finding new experiences in church? Were you learning something new? Were you overcoming some sin, some sin habit? What was going on? Were you, were you finding the joy of praying with other people? Were you in the middle of serving the Lord maybe with evangelism or ministering to somebody? What, what was going on? Maybe you first discovered how to really worship and you were just really worshiping and you made that time and you look forward to meeting him you knew for certain that the end was coming at the end of this sermon series and at the end of August, don't you think you'd go back there? How many of you think, yeah, I think I'd go back there? 
Funny thing about the Holy Spirit, he, he probably told you exactly what you needed to do about two minutes into this. If you take just a second, which we're going to do in a moment, and we're going to just be quiet, we'll probably, he'll probably shine that light for us to show us where that is, how to return home. At this time, I'm going to ask the praise team if they would come up. And This time, we're not going to pray with anybody else. It's just it's us and the Lord now, right where you are. You're sitting beside God's people. You're in a holy assembly, but right now, it's just going to be a private time between you and Father God. I'm going to step out of the way, and I'm going to stop talking. And the Lord has got your attention like 30 minutes ago about something specific. Whatever that is, now's the time to go to him with your words and say this, this very dangerous prayer. Father God, what do you want me to do? Let's just at least start our prayer there. Ready? Father God, what do you want me to do?